Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurachek. Dr. Kunal Ghosh, pleasure to have you on the show. You are the founder of Inscopics, which is based in Palo Alto in California, and you are mapping brain circuits using imaging. And you actually are doing lots of work both in academia and industry to map these circuits. And yeah, just really cool. I really love this kind of stuff that's useful for both academia and industry, having me personally, my feet in both. So uh, pleasure to have you on the show. And, and do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Thank you, Leighton. A pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for following in Scopix and, and thank you for the opportunity. So I think you, you said quite a bit already in that kind introduction and appreciate that. I founded in Scopix almost a decade ago now, together with where then my former advisors, Mark Schnitzer and Basil Gamal. And the technology came out of a research project at Stanford that several folks together participated in. And it was really inspired by the need to understand how the brain works and especially how it doesn't work in the context of disease. And we realized as researchers and as tool developers that there really was a lack of data, mechanistic data on how brain circuits give rise to function and how these circuits um, go awry in the context of dysfunction and disease. And of course, you get data with innovative tools. And what we realized that the missing data was due to a, a gap in tools. There really weren't any tools to look at large scale neural circuit activity. And by that, hundreds to thousands of neurons, potentially tens of thousands of neurons, but yet with single cell um, specificity and single cell resolution, so that you could really paint um, a picture, figuratively, literally perhaps, of how the brain is working, how different neurons um, are connecting to each other across different cell types, across different um, areas of the brain, and working together to give rise to function. So the whole premise of leveraging neural circuit activity to understand um, brain function was the premise that gave rise to Inscopics. And we realized um, that the, the need here was really for a tool, a tool that could deliver these kinds of data sets where researchers could stream data of hundreds, thousands of neurons firing and doing things in the context of behavior. And then researchers would be able to uh, correlate the underlying neuronal activity extracted at a population scale um, with behavior and really make meaning of what the brain is doing in the context of, of behavior. So that was a miniature microscope that we invented while we were at Stanford. That was the tool that we felt had the, the right set of, if you will, requirements and specifications, single cell resolution, hundred to thousands um, of cells imaged recorded simultaneously. And then of course, all of this in the context of behavior and thanks, thanks to genetic um, labeling, the ability to literally target a specific cell type and watch that in the context of whatever brain function one was studying. That, of course, um, was an exciting innovation. We got some really nice preliminary data at, at, while we were still at Stanford. And Inscopics was born out of that project and to really pursue the overall vision here of now developing the key enabling data sets based on this tool to really provide the brain research community with not only a platform to be able to understand any brain function using any preclinical animal model of choice, but then to also provide, as you were alluding to in your introduction, industry and specifically pharma with the platform and the data sets to show how normal brain circuits get disrupted in disease. And hopefully that paves the way then to the development of precision therapeutics that ultimately address the very need that we're all um, here to, to address, which is, can we get better drugs to the clinic? Can we um, get better devices into the clinic? Can we really help stem the growing um, um, tide of mental illness, brain disease and society, and really make a difference when it comes to the understanding and the treatment of, of mental illness and, and brain disease? So that's what we're about. And that's a, a little bit of how I got into all of this. 
Yeah, very cool. I think I, I think it's really inspiring story that, and I completely agree that the tools are the thing that makes everything happen. Like the scientists and, and researchers, everything, every everybody else it, is really dependent on the tools. And without that tool, they can't progress and they can't go further. And so I, I'm curious why you did choose an imaging technique instead of something else, implantable electrode. There's the Utah electrode, and you were saying, okay. Yep. Tens of thousands of neurons versus a hundred or so that's on the Utah electrode array. Because I guess the downside for imaging is that you, you have to pop open whatever you're looking at. You have to have a clear field of view. And then yeah. obviously you have the physics of imaging where you have a depth of focus. So you, you can only look at a certain sliver at, a, at each point. So why especially imaging? Yeah, great question. So I think I, I go back to what were we trying to really enable. And we were trying to enable new kinds of data sets, new kinds of data that provide um, insights into how a specific brain circuit, let's say in the hippocampus or, or the hypothalamus, um, is working in the context of a specific behavior or brain function being studied. And when we looked at the spectrum of tools that were available, we realized that there weren't really any tools that were able to provide these kinds of data sets. And to be specific, you mentioned um, electrophysiology as an example and, 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 and the UTRA as an example. While there's no question that electrophysiology has been the mainstay of neuro tools and neuroscience research, and the UTRA, of course, has been um, pretty phenomenal in the impact it's made both in the research community and then also, of course, in, in patients in the BMI and neuroprosthetic world. Um, however, having said that, electrophysiology provides limited data in the context of the number of cells, and you, you mentioned that, but maybe even more importantly, what electrophysiology lacks, um, especially when you think about multi-electrode arrays like the UTA array, is the ability to look at large numbers of neurons, whether it's a hundred or a thousand, and be able to look at it with single neuron um, resolution. And then of course, to do all of this in behavior, meaning without perturbing normal behavior or being compatible with any behavioral assay, for example, in a disease context. And then the most perhaps, I think, interesting virtue of imaging is, of course, by definition of implying that imaging has all of the aforementioned qualities of scale, single cell resolution, and enabling all of this in behavior. But I think the last dimension that is thanks to labeling strategy is the fact that imaging allows us to target and then image and record from any specific cell and cell type that one is interested in studying. And this is thanks to the um, explosion of genetically encoded fluorescing proteins and then opsins in the optogenetics world that allow us to then modulate neuronal activity with extremely high specificity with light. So I think the advent of um, all these molecular biology tools, genetically encoded um, fluorescing proteins, opsins, ways to deliver them with viral vectors, such as those that are being used to deliver our mRNA vaccines for the COVID shots. These technologies, I think, have resulted in imaging becoming this almost ideal modality where you can get the scale, you can get the single cell resolution, and you can get the cell type specificity. Now, one might argue that is cell type specificity really that important and what truly is significant about that? I think there's a growing consensus that when it comes to especially understanding specific cell types and fingerprinting their functional phenotype, what does a specific cell type in the brain functionally do in kind of building that map of the brain? You know, we have all these incredible anatomical tools to build anatomical maps of the brain, but we really don't have the functional tools to build a functional map of the brain. So I think what imaging allows is building a map of the brain, both anatomically with high resolution modalities and functionally with what Inscopics is developing and commercializing that allows you to really have a complete kind of picture, literally, of how the brain looks like, how it mechanistically functions in the context of behavior. You can fingerprint the specific cells and their signatures and what the cell types are implicated in. And then of course, translationally speaking, from a disease perspective, we can identify which specific cell types are you know, behaving, working abnormally in the context of disease. And then with all these incredible molecular profiling tools and the emerging area of both single cell transcriptomics and spatial multiomics, we can start profiling the specific cell types molecularly and identify druggable targets. None of this is possible with electrophysiology. 
So I think the, the beauty of imaging and why we chose that over 10 years ago as the key modality to enable these kinds of circuit maps is because we felt that it had the best of what electrophysiology was offering and also the best of literally what we were seeing in the context of fluorescence microscopy and imaging and other areas of the life sciences. We were seeing what imaging and fluorescence microscopy had done in many other areas outside of neuroscience and indeed also in neuroscience in, in in vitro um, and in other domains. And we said that let's try to build basically a tiny fluorescence microscope that could be integrated with a digital camera and be worn on the cranium of any preclinical model. And this tiny microscope would then be able to offer the single cell resolution by virtue of being a microscope, the scale by virtue of integrating a digital camera together with the microscope so we can look at fairly large fields of view. And then thanks to genetic labeling and fluorescence, we would then be able to also identify an image from any specific cell type. And, and that last dimension, again, is a dimension that electrophysiology obviously is unable to provide because electrodes are, are being implanted literally where one wants to record from. And often you have to deduce after the fact what cell type you think you are recording from. And in many cases, like the Utah arrays, you're also not necessarily recording from a specific cell, let alone knowing the cell type. It's often an average signal. So again, it's the nexus of these different, if you will, specifications with the cell type specificity that we felt were all important to generate this map of the brain, anatomical and functional, that led us down the imaging path and building this wearable digital fluorescence microscope, if you will, that now, of course, has led to over 150 papers and clearly um, has made some impact in the research community at the very least with respect to understanding the basis of normal brain function and in many cases, dysfunction. Yeah, definitely. I, I completely agree. Looking at the cell types, like you were saying, is extra dimension, a few dimensions of basically probing and investigation that, and you're basically seeing the world in black and white if you're not using that. Okay. So I'm curious about, I, I love these kind of stories, the bench to bedside story. Tell me about this. Like, how did you, uh, since you started with the research and then you're like, okay, I'm going to leave academia. I'm going to go into industry. I'm going to create this company. How did you do that? Why did you do that? Tell me how this came about. Yeah, great question. So I mentioned a little bit in the introduction as to you know why we found it in Scopix and why I personally you know thought that this was the right thing to do after the research project came to a natural close at Stanford. We found it in Scopix to go after the bigger opportunity here, the bigger vision. Again, this came out of a research context, but the developments were all inspired by large unmet clinical needs. We realized that we had to develop novel tools to ultimately get to addressing these large unmet clinical needs. But once the tool was there, at least in the form of a prototype, at least, and with preliminary data, we realized that we needed to, to really you know, turn this into a company so that we could successfully translate the tool into a product, scale it, uh, and then get a critical mass of science and research going that would validate the utility of, of this tool. But then ultimately, the company's goal would be to really leverage the tool and specifically the data to plug into the large unmet clinical needs. And that's what Inscopix is today really focused on. No question about the fact that we still very much care about empowering the research community, catalyzing brain science. So back to your question of why we founded Inscopix, it was really realizing that we have this incredible tool that can perhaps be what the field has always sought, the ability to generate these circuit maps of, of the brain. And if we have that, and if we can empower basic scientists with it, they can go and discover and publish their nature cell science paper. But then in the meantime, let's build out uh, specific assays that we can now, hopefully together with partners in the drug development and de device development ecosystem, leverage to start understanding, again, specific circuits that are being disrupted, understand how we can then build specific assays that leverage these circuit biomarkers that we would be identifying based on the circuit disruptions that the platform is identifying. And then these assays that we would be developing based on um, the circuit biomarkers that we're identifying could really then become um, 
the standard for screening compounds for efficacy in a world where we pretty much fly blind when it comes to drug development. We have this news this morning, I, I believe, of the Alzheimer's drug from Biogen being approved. But there's a fascinating article from the New York Times just yesterday about the dilemma that the FDA was in. And I think there is a fierce debate about whether this drug should have been approved or not. But I think there is unanimous consensus that the compound is barely effective and there really were no ways to predict efficacy until these larger clinical trials were run. And of course, there's this fascinating history of how the um, compound was submitted for approval, was going to be rejected, and then they came up with more data from a clinical trial that had been abruptly, I believe, called off. They did, ran some statistical gymnastics on the data, and lo and behold, they were able to get it over the finish line. But I think whether someone believes in the drug or someone believes it should not have been approved, there is no question that the entire community feels that we need predictability in the drug development process. We need to understand unequivocally if a drug has clinical potential or not, and not have to resort to statistical gymnastics to try to get a drug over the finish line and be faced with a situation where patients might be getting the drug, but they might see little or no effect. So I think that is really the void that Inscopix is seeking to fill. And that was the promise that we always had since the founding of the company, that if we can um, truly get this product to a point where it scales to the broader research community, if we can then develop specific biomarkers in areas like Alzheimer's, for example, like Parkinson's that are based on our circuit models of these diseases, then we can leverage these biomarkers to develop assays and leverage the assays to screen compounds for the ability to correct the circuit. And we would then have a much higher um, predictive power, if you will, in, in the compound, and we would not be flying blind. So that was really always the reason for why we founded Inscopix. And frankly speaking, we've come almost full circle now, and we're extremely focused now on this larger goal of bringing better compounds to the clinic and having much higher predictability in the drug development or device development process. Yeah, it is silly. Like uh, a lot of these depression, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's medications, you know, like you were saying, the statistical gymnastics, I love that term because it really is like a lot of hand waving. And, and then you get stuff like, oh, the patients feel 6% better. What does that even mean? And, uh, but with your model, you could cross validate cross reference, okay, these uh, typical circuit patterns and then, and then you know, the aberrant ones, and then see what kind of changes that does. So you can verify what's going on. I think that that's a really cool idea. So yeah, how does that work? Are you guys partnering with these big pharmaceutical companies or more on the FDA side, like lobbying the government, like requiring them to use your technology or what's the kind of... I would say that today our main um, goal is to partner with um, stakeholders across the ecosystem. I think we still have a long way to go to prove the translational value of our circuit-based models and to really establish the platform and these assays, as you were saying, as the standard in, in, in pharma and in drug development, I think that is exactly the goal. We really think there is potential here for our um, platform and the circuit-based assays to become the standard for preclinical to phase one. That is very much what we would hope um, we can get to, but there's a long way to go to, to get there. We definitely have to continue to prove, especially in areas that have seen a lot of failures, translational failures. We have to you know, prove that these models work, that these models have higher predictive power. Um, and that's what we're you know, focused on. Again, really taking this methodically, not necessarily jumping the gun. This is a very difficult space and we're not only fighting tough odds, but we're fighting a culture that unfortunately has faced one too many failures and has every right to be skeptical about the next latest and greatest innovation that has arrived. So I think we're taking a very methodical and pragmatic approach. We care very much about the science. We care very much about making sure that our models, let's take Parkinson's as an example, where we have perhaps the most preliminary data and um, expertise than any other disease area yet. Even in an area like Parkinson's, where the disease is fairly well understood, we have what we think is a circuit model for the disease. We have still some ways to go to really validate the predictive power of this circuit model, to run studies with a known good, known bad compounds, to potentially also still correlate this data with clinically 
um, readable data. And this is where EEG, again, becomes important and quite complementary, as opposed to, of course, some of the differences we talked about um, at the outset in the context of brain circuit maps in the research market. EEG and LFP signals still have a really important place to play when it comes to correlating the imaging data to clinical um, readable data and validating the translational relevance of our um, imaging data. So I think the areas where we're really focused on today are, I would say, driving the value of the data and the predictive power of the data for drug development. We would love to be talking to the FDA. I think that's absolutely a direction we would be going in. But I think at this point, we're really trying to assemble the right data packages. We're trying to really bolster the the confidence, if you will, of the the circuit-based models. And we're also trying to strike as many partnerships as we can with stakeholders in the drug and um, device development ecosystem. And many of these companies love, our audience here know of, and a couple of the companies we work with, it's all public information, Estellas, Lundbeck, these are well-known neuro-focused drug companies, Lundbeck certainly, Estellas has broader programs. But having said that, with both of these companies, we're working together in a specific and specific models, both happen to be in the basal ganglia, where again, you know, we have a lot of expertise. And these are basal ganglia disorders. Company, these two companies are looking at different therapeutic areas, but they all relate to the basal ganglia. And we're trying to really take our circuit-based models for these different diseases, test their translational relevance, take tool compounds and screen them on our assay, and then hopefully really do the hard work and convince these companies and others in the ecosystem that if you have basal ganglia disorders, whether it's Parkinson's, Huntington's, maybe even OCD, we might be able to be a partner for you with a better uh, model, with a better translational bridge to your IND submission and your phase one clinical trial. And we can at the very least de-risk your clinical trials with better preclinical data that is more predictive of efficacy. So that's, those are examples of the kind of initiatives that we're working on And we'd love to take this across different disease verticals, not just basal ganglia and basal ganglia disorders. We'd love to, for example, work in the prefrontal cortex and think about neurodevelopmental disorders and disorders like autism, where we also have seen in the basic research community some very interesting data from our customers where they've identified a specific prefrontal cortex neurons and, and circuits that could be implicated in behavioral disorders. So can we capitalize on some of this basic research and really look for circuit signatures of autism And again, work with partners um, and foundations like the Simons Foundation, for example, that has invested heavily in autism to make good use of these circuit-based models and again, test their translational relevance and ultimately leverage them for the development of, of better drugs. So those are some examples of the kinds of translational relevant projects we're, we're working on and some of the partners that, that we work with. We do not work with the Simons Foundation, I should be clear about that, but they, of course, would be a terrific partner in, in this emerging ecosystem to work with. Okay. So yeah, what is the role of this circuit dysregulation? Is You're mentioning these kind of differences, almost like fingerprints of, of these deviations from the norm. Is this something that you can visualize, pre- even predict before it happens, or, or how big of a role does it play as well? Yeah, very good question, Leighton. So I'll give you a simple example. I'll I'll call it simple. It might not be quite simple, but it's in the field and and, in the context of epilepsy. So we had a very interesting project, and this is also public information, with Janssen, part of the GNJ group, several years ago in epilepsy. And we found that our platform could detect epilepsy in the brain before the EEG signal was indicative of a seizure. And I think that's a concrete example of where you could literally see the brain going into a seizure before EEG detected it. So I think to me, there's no better example of the promise of imaging and imaging-based circuit signatures that have the potential to be more predictive, but also earlier in their, if you will, detectability or earlier in their sensitivity than other modalities. And and the epilepsy example for me always becomes the most powerful demonstration of this promise that we were able to, in a cyanic um, acid induced model of epilepsy, mouse model of epilepsy, we were able to literally see the brain light up, literally. That's what imaging allows you to do. You see all these neurons firing in synchrony. You see these whole field, whole brain, flashes, waves, and that you know starts to basically preview a seizure. So literally to the question you asked, we can see in, in the brain 
a circuit signature, in this case, a pretty dramatic signature of an event that's about to happen, and in this case, a seizure. And we can also pick this before the EEG signal is able to detect a seizure. So to me, that is the power of our platform, and that is the power of imaging-based circuit models and imaging-based circuit biomarkers. We should be able to pick out signatures of disease early. We should be able to quantify these, and then we should be able to intervene, whether it's through pharmacological means or through device means. So if you take the epilepsy example, imagine a, a company like Neuropace, or imagine a more sophisticated neuromodulation um, device protocol that could work, perhaps thinking ahead, dreaming um, ahead with either some version of our technology in human that is reading out this activity, or some version of uh, an improved closed loop electrical system that capitalizes on our data and that's able to read an early signature of epilepsy, again, either through some you know, imaging technology that translates into humans in the future, or through some correlative EEG data um, or some correlative high bandwidth data that is uh, aligned with the imaging data that we are seeing in the mouse model. Um, so imagine if we could read this out in, in a human patient and if we could do it before the seizure and intervene, with a neuromodulation protocol, we could stop a seizure before it happens. So I, I think that's the power of the technology, that it allows us to literally watch the brain in the context of disease. We can pick out these signatures early. And if indeed their translational potential bears out, which we certainly hope they will, and in Parkinson's, we have every reason to believe that that will be the case. And certainly it might continue to um, be the case in many other diseases. And if all of these early readouts um, truly you know, bear out in terms of translational promise, then we could really transform, I think, the landscape of therapeutic development by having early signatures, early readouts of disease in, in animal models, giving pharma companies and device development companies early insights into the disease pathophysiology, giving them concrete readouts that they can intervene in and then test the efficacy of their therapeutic before going to the clinic. So you guys are in the business of time travel. Very nice. <laughs> how For the epilepsy, how much further uh, in advance? Is it seconds, minutes, hours? On the order of seconds. Yeah, okay. seconds to minutes. Okay. Okay, interesting. Okay, Which is very, still pretty yeah. compelling when it comes to therapeutic intervention. Yeah, for example, if you're driving a car, that could give you enough time to pull off exactly. the side of the road. So as anybody knows who, who has worked with video, this generates a lot of data. And uh, you obviously have analysis solutions to, to deal with this. Is this something that you guys are kind of working on by yourselves or, or I, I, I was reading something like you, you crowdsource uh, a lot of this, these discoveries. And uh, so how does this work and how does, yeah, so how does that work, the bringing the community in and then how does it work with sifting through enormous amounts of data? Yeah, those, those are great questions, loaded questions. Uh, so I think we, on one hand, really want the research community to be independent and empowered. So we really care about building turnkey solutions for the research community, which includes really helping them through the entire data analysis pipeline. For a typical research customer, we will want them to be able to get from raw data to their insights as quickly as possible, and ideally as independently as they can. So they don't have to rely on having a bioinformatician in their lab, or they don't have to rely on Inscopix to do their data analysis for them. So we're today very focused on building cloud-based infrastructure that allows researchers to take their raw data sets from the platform and then analyze their data either offline and send process data into the cloud or potentially work with the raw data in the cloud and, and start really applying some of our analytical routines, maybe other analytical routines that have been developed by other researchers and, and truly start making meaning of their data. So the entire kind of sample prep to result, results workflow, which is a you know, common moniker used, for example, in, in genomics, but the sample prep to results workflow is something we care a lot about. And from day one of Inscopix, while we of course started as a tool company, we invested quite a bit in streamlining the sample prep. We sell reagents. We have a very sophisticated uh, field scientific consulting team that provides a lot of application knowledge and scientific support to our research customers. And then we've also invested increasingly are, are doubling down on, on the data analysis pipeline, which is the back end of the sample prep to results workflow. So you're absolutely right. It's one thing getting the data. It's another thing really making meaning of this data. And we find that a lot of our researchers honestly struggle with the magnitude of the data and the complexity sometimes of the analysis that, that they have to be um, 
doing on this data. With this new investment in data analysis and cloud-based software, we are very excited to empower the research community to really have a scalable platform to manage their data, share their data, and apply either their own or our or community-generated data analysis modules that allows them to get results in the context of their application. And then for pharma, we tend to think that this cloud-based platform will be even more important as they obviously generate perhaps much more data than an individual lab might, and as they believe, of course, in, in a much faster timeline to results and in, in more high throughput and turnkey studies. So for pharma, we believe this cloud-based um, platform will be in some ways even more important. And that's where we also want to play a, a bigger role as it comes to ourselves using this platform to finding these circuit signatures that we were talking about, building these data models, and potentially with pharma running automated high throughput assays that are assays as much as they are in biology as they are on the cloud. Since many of these data models will be quantitative data models where the circuit pattern will truly be a code and we will want to potentially build a classifier around that code. And, and then that really paves the way for um, a machine learning driven screen where you can now identify the therapeutic potential of a compound by their ability to correct the code. And all of that can be done on the cloud. So we're very excited about the data frontier. We believe that it is incredibly important for the neuroscience lab of the future. We really do think that we have to enable the sample prep to results workflow for that lab of the future so that they are successful with their data and they can publish quickly. And then we would love to leverage this platform for pharma collaborations and for our own assay development and, and, and data model development. And I think there will always be these two segments that we will have to cater to, the research segment that will have its own use cases and needs and where sharing will be key. And then the pharma industrial segment where throughput and scale and, um, of course, the ability to ensure data privacy will be key as they work on clinically relevant compounds. Yeah, definitely. I think it's going to be a monumental feat distilling terabytes and terabytes of data into a little graph that shows maybe a small deviation. That's yep. going to be, but I like it. Like that's the future and that's essentially like the machine yep, learning. Yeah, exactly. For a researcher, we get a common request is I, I wish we had a button that I could press and out would pop my figure, my paper figure from the data. So that's the goal with the the platform for the research segment. We truly want to have these push button figure generators that will allow them to take their raster plots and then generate the raster plot itself as a figure. So that will probably be figure one. But seriously speaking, we would love to generate a clustering and other kinds of analysis for them that automatically kind of generate paper ready figures. And that's always been a common request from, from the research community. So that's where we're taking the data analysis for the research community. And then of course for pharma, and the device community, there's somewhat different use cases and needs, but still very much dependent on the ability to have a scalable platform for data management, sharing, and high throughput analysis. Yeah, very cool. Kunal, this has been really good. I've really enjoyed this. As a last question, what are you excited about? What's, what's the thing that's on your radar? Yeah, so I think maybe just in the interest of time and, and making this more timely, we have a paper coming out just in a week that is the first demonstration of our technology and uh, miniscope-based imaging. We call the miniature microscope miniscope. And the first demonstration of the miniscope-based imaging in a non-human primate, in, in a macaque. And I think this is perhaps of maybe even more relevance to, to, to your specific interests and, and the interests and needs of, of this audience, because it really shows the opportunity here for Inscopix and our platform to help in device development and modulation development in BMI development. So this is the first demonstration of an Inscopix Invista system, which is the commercial product of the commercialized version of the Miniscope product. And the Invista system was implanted, not the system itself, but an optical needle coupled with the system was um, implanted in the uh, motor cortex of a behaving macaque and recorded from just over 100 neurons of single cell neuronal data over three months in the context of very you know, simple arm reach tasks. And again, this is proof of concept data to show that the same technology, the same platform can not only help in generating the circuit biomarkers and models for drug development, but can also help in guiding the development of more precise 
DBS and more precise neuromodulation and potentially you know, help in guiding the development of closed loop brain computer interfaces. Maybe in the future at some point, an optical brain computer interface might also be possible. So um, when you ask me what am I most excited about, I think because it's just top of my mind and, and because of when we're, we're talking about this, I, I'm really most excited about this paper coming out next week in Cell Reports. Jonathan Nassi, our Senior Director of Translational Science, together with collaborators at UC Berkeley, Jose Carmina, Karen Moxon at UC Davis, Saman Cruz at, at UT Austin, a true village, if you will, it takes to get device development and MECAC work done. It's an incredible team that has incredible results to report. And I'm excited about the work and I'm excited about its translational implications in the context of brain machine interface and neuromodulation development. Yeah, wow, that is very exciting. And this episode will have aired by then already. So uh, listeners can already search that. Do you know what it's going to be called? I believe it's something on the lines of head-mounted calcium imaging on a rhesus macaque, but we can always follow up and, and share the specific details. The first author is Anil Bolimanta and Jonathan Nassi is the senior author. Okay. Yeah, it'll be uh, the link will be in the show notes. Kunal, this has been excellent. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? No, this was great. This was a lot of fun. Layden, I think we covered a lot of ground and I hope this is interesting and fun for the listeners out there. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.